Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Superversive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person, real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outre-Terre. It is not intended for children. This is Jim Donovan. It is 10.30 on a Tuesday. I didn't expect to be coming back so quick to these, after Control kicked me to the curb with involuntary, unpaid administrative leave. My stipend with the organization did not make me a wealthy man by any means, but it was sufficient to keep a relatively nice apartment here in Los Angeles. It should be noted that the bar for nice here is no cockroaches and fewer than three stabbings in the neighborhood a month. Thanks to the leave, I have had to abandon my home in search of a slightly more affordable fare. This forced me to put my brother, John, the ghoul, into a storage yard, which I have both warded and soundproofed magically, so that he cannot escape, and so that random thieves will not be interested in sticking their noses where they don't belong. I now live in Glendale, which is only a half mile away from my beloved Burbank. I have had to give up my office, as I couldn't make the lease. I've gone from a two-bedroom, two-bath that costs around three grand a month to a studio apartment that costs 1500 a month. I still can't afford it. The place smells of broken dreams and despair. And tequila. There are cockroaches everywhere. Every night, I violently wake up as a more adventurous roach finds its way into my mouth. Thrice, I have had cholos attempting to mug me. Thrice, I have had to use the Verum Visio to make them think their skin was on fire. The third time, I might have forgotten to stop that effect on the guy who jumped me. I imagine he's in a jail cell now, still screaming. Ooh, or maybe a psych ward. As I said, it has been three months since I was placed on administrative leave. I burned through my savings in month two. I have now taken to selling plasma, because Control found a way to get my private investigator license suspended, pending investigation into Hawkwood's Golem. What I'm trying to say is, Control created a situation where I was vulnerable, destitute, and alone. And that is why I accepted Oberon's offer. I say offer as though I had a choice. <laughs> uh, it's even funnier than implying that Control is a competent leader. Alright, enough pettiness. I was in the park, sitting under a tree, using my smartphone to look through the supernatural classified ads. Try to scrape together enough money to pay my rent at the end of the month. There is always someone looking to use a little magic to improve their lives. And while I don't like resorting to that level of demeaning spell slinging, I figured having a conscience was a luxury I couldn't afford. For instance, some woman said she wanted to get a B-list movie star to fall in love with her. And she was willing to pay well to make it happen. It's a little rapey, but, I mean, ten grand for one day's work is ten grand for one day's work. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, my musing was interrupted by the sound of trumpets, a gust of hot summer wind, and the smell of freshly mown grass. And suddenly, I was sitting in the presence of royalty. He looked different than the first time I had been forced into his company. Whereas the last time, he was wearing some nice, leafy, tunicky garb and some pants. I'm not good with clothing or memory. This time, he wore a long, flowing cape, made out of flowers, and had moss around his shoulders. On his chest, he wore a breastplate made of cedar. And for his pants, it looked like blossoms of kudzu, stitched together. If he had been immortal, he would have been itching so bad from the kudzu. On his head, he wore an ivory crown. His skin was a slight bronze color. I don't remember it being that color. Can the Fae change their skin color at will like chameleons? I have no idea. He towered over his companions, who would all come up to my hip were I standing, and no further. They were squat creatures, similar to our dwarves in size, but their bodies were proportional. Each dwarf wore a stocking cap made of fiery orange. They also wore green wool pants and tunics, and they carried blades made of what looked like sharpened deer antlers on their hips. Every single dwarf also wore a sneer on his face. The king had a look of benign indifference. <laughs> Royalty. 
One dwarf, the tallest of the lot, came right up to me, opened a scroll, and in a loud voice, reminiscent of the Lollipop Guild, said, On this, the year of our lord, 2023, Oberon King does come before the wizard James Donovan and demands of him the first of many tributes and services, as is befitting a subject of the summer court. Perforce, your right to decline has been stripped through your many and repeated uses of arcane arts, all of which fall firmly in the purview of our gracious and benevolent king. And as such, any attempt at refusal shall be construed as an act of war against the summer courts itself and shall be treated in kind. As you may recall, I was sitting when they arrived. The whole affair took me off guard, so I was still sitting when they, um live with this pronouncement. I am sure I had a dumbfounded expression on my face when I said, uh, okay, what, um, what do you want me to do? The courier dwarf pulled out his dagger and brandished it menacingly at me, saying, Son of Adam, if you do not get on your feet in respect or fall on your face in obeisance, I will strip the skin from your flesh and display it as a banner standard when next we go to war the skin from my flesh. Gotta work on your anatomy to get the threats right, bub. I got to my feet slowly and said, Sorry, King. Got me by surprise. What was it you wanted me to do? I speak for his royal majesty, insolent cur. So spake Tiny the dwarf. I stared down at him through half-closed eyelids and then raised my gaze to the king, saying, I don't speak with middlemen. What do you want? Oberon continued to ignore me. Suddenly, I felt a sharp blow at the back of my legs and felt my hair be drawn back and my head yanked. I felt the sharp warmth of a blade made of antler resting against my jugular. Once more, I will say it, and no more. To me, you shall address your inquiries, for I, Trumpkin, am the loyal servant and spokesman of the king, who has chosen to grace you with his presence, and no more beside. Fine, Trumpkin, I said through gritted teeth. More annoyed than threatened. What do you want me to do? The blade was removed from my neck, though I still felt his hand grabbing my hair, holding me in place. The king's servant, Caitlin the Lanon She, known as Cat, sought to seduce and enslave the mortal woman, Jennifer Abernathy. The mortal, strong of wit and will, resisted Cat's charms, and in so doing, turned her into the mortal's slave. You, James Donovan, enhanced the currish mortal's hold over her subject by approving of her servitude, saying it was fitting for a fay. In so doing, you have deprived our majesty of a valued subject and given a mortal woman an honor and fitting her kind. I thought back a moment. Oh yeah, right. That was one of the first cases I took after the server's reset. Yeah, I remember that one. One of the rare times I didn't actually have to do anything after a cursory inspection. You will free Caitlin, or his majesty will hear of it, and give right over your mortal frame to the beasts and birds of Tirnanog. I sighed. This was what I'd gotten myself into. I I should have just killed the Leonon she back when I had the chance. The Fae would have been irritated, but they would have understood. His majesty does not care what measures you take. But you will destroy the mortal cur and set our subject free. He wants me to kill a person? I did not say that, you uncouth barbarian. I said destroy. The methods you take are up to your discretion and imagination. But it must be done by a week's end. It's already Thursday. Yes, you would do well to work fast. As he is beneficent, King Oberon shall allocate sums to your account befitting of a kingly dispensation for a favored subject. And with that, the entire entourage disappeared in a flash of light so bright it left after images. I was left stunned, confused, and a little bothered. I didn't owe Jenny Abernathy anything, but she was still a mortal who had managed to get one over on the Fey. She didn't deserve to be destroyed for that. I still had my phone out from earlier, decided to do some quick online searches for her, using a secure website, of course. If I was about to be responsible for potentially criminal acts against a woman, didn't need an online paper trail leading back to me. Turned out, Jenny was pretty popular in the LGBT movement, that she had come out as non-binary. 
Apparently some formerly famous person had done this in a bid to become relevant. And so other attention whores, I mean celebrities, were jumping on the same train. I sat and pondered under that tree for a bit. Yes, it was an L.A. park, which meant there were three or four homeless guys defecating within my line of sight. But it was still nicer than my apartment. Smelled better, too, if nothing else. Jenny Abernathy was a phony, and probably guilty of other, more heinous crimes. Most famous people are. In order to get fame and riches, you have to make several deals with Mephistopheles, or other gods of this world. Jesus promised his followers that they'd be hated and killed for following him, but promises them sonship in the kingdom of heaven. Satan promises the world while damning the soul. It's not really surprising how many people trade the here and now for the future. Even still, if it weren't for the promise of getting paid, I don't think I'd consider working for Oberon for a second. The threat of death wasn't pleasant, but I've been threatened before. Anyway, I saw her captured laying on she, Cat, acting as a personal manager and best friend. She was plastered in about half of the candid paparazzi photos, always looking mad, exhausted, ready to die, standing next to a very vivacious and flirtatious Jenny Abernathy, or, as her stage name dictates, Jenna. I saw them together at a GLAD event. Apparently Jenny was receiving an award. I realized then how I could destroy Jenny Abernathy. Hmm. I still had some resources in the LAPD that hadn't abandoned me yet. It was an easy thing to get Kat's cell phone number. I texted her. I have a solution to your mortal problem, fey creature. Call me back immediately to plan, or forever suffer as a slave to a mortal. I got the phone call mere seconds after I hit send. Kat was not pleased to hear from me again, but she started weeping uncontrollably when she heard that Oberon had sent her help. With Kat's aid, I devised a plan that I thought would work. Jenny had gotten deep into the occult, as most famous people tend to. This was my inn. The tie between her and the Leon on she would be psychic in nature, and fortunately, such threads are totally visible when seen through the Verambicio. Wouldn't take much to cut the cord and then set Cat free from there. Cat, in her position as Jenny's manager, set up a 9 p.m. seance with me, Jenny, Cat, and a couple other highfalutin types at Jenny's palatial home in Studio City. It was in a gated neighborhood, policed with security guards all of whom held MP5s. They checked my ID very thoroughly as I drove to the gatehouse and said, Hi, I'm a psychic. Here to do a reading for Jenny Abernathy. They didn't care if I really was a psychic. They, they probably didn't even believe in the supernatural. They just needed to call Jenny and get verification that a man in a very run-down car, whose muffler was rattling like it was about to explode, was indeed supposed to visit. I was waved on through. I drove my little car through what felt like a park. The grass was green, there were trees everywhere. Honestly, it looked like anywhere else in America. That isn't a giant, disgusting city. The only difference being, of course, the really nice mansions that are littered all over the place. I pulled up to her mansion. There was a gaudy fountain, complete with nude statues holding jars. There was a hedgerow maze in the front. And there were several hundred thousand dollar cars parked in a circular driveway. As I drove up, I saw a cat come out to meet me. I heard your vehicle from half a kilometer away, mortal. And I could smell the face stink on you the entire drive up. Don't you people ever bathe, or do you reserve that for when you're trying to seduce my kind? None of my sisters would bother seducing you, Magus. You're already Father Oberon's slave. You'll be food for us soon enough. Up yours. How witty. The seance room is prepared. I have the guests properly lubricated with alcohol and fentanyl. It won't matter what you do, they'll believe you. I resisted the urge to retch right then and there. I hate the Fae. Conniving, scheming, lying cretins. Condemned to the darkest corners of hell, the whole lot of them. Anyway, personal prejudices aside, I followed Cat into the palatial estate. I was wearing my usual black t-shirt and shorts combo. It's L.A., and my car's A.C. doesn't work, so the black hides the sweat marks. Cat walked brusquely, as though she wanted to be sure this was done speedily. As a result, I didn't catch more than a passing glimpse of grotesque modern artwork, the kind that truly perverts the original purpose of art in the name of self-expression. 
as though being able to express depravity were anything to be celebrated. We walked into a sunroom that boasted a large circular table. Four women, an African-American hip-hop artist of enough renown that even I had heard of her. We'll call her Ruth, as that's apparently part of her real name. An Indian woman wearing a traditional sari. I learned her name was Amrataya or something like that. Ginny Abernathy, of course. And I'm pretty sure the fourth woman was Gwyneth Paltrow. As I walked up, I heard Ruth slur out. Shouldn't we be doing this at midnight or something? Kat rolled her eyes and said, That's just a superstition. Any time the spirits are willing to talk is a good time for a seance. I was about to interject and then realized I didn't care enough. She wanted to get this over with, and to be honest, so did I. These idiots were just here to make it possible for me to get Ginny and Kat in the same room and to not make it appear odd when I started playing with my soul stone. Speaking of which, at this time, I reached into my cargo pockets for the soul stone and fished it out. It was already glowing. Some ambient energy, probably from the Fey, was waking it up. Gwyneth Paltrow said, Wow, that crystal is super in tune to the spiritual realm. I can feel it from over here. Is that quartz? I said, uh, Actually, I never looked into it. I decided to be honest and see what it would take me. It feeds on the spiritual energy of the deceased, and as such, I use it to do all manner of arcane practices. The Indian woman said, Does this mean you're a necromancer? That stopped me in my tracks. Hadn't considered it that way before, but I do benefit from the actions of a legitimate dead necromancer. And technically, I have captured several dead souls to feel the stone. Ugh. Um, sort of. I said. But don't worry, we won't be raising an army of the undead tonight. That got the ladies laughing way more than that joke should have. Just drunk enough. I motioned to Cat, who turned off the lights. I let the soul stone be the only light. The women oohed and awed. Guess that makes sense. LED light can make a play at radiant pearlescence, but nothing really captures that ethereal rainbow glow like the physical embodiment of a human soul. Gwyneth said, I need to sell these. We'd make millions. What's your number? Cat hissed at her to be silent. Gwyneth pouted. I ignored the both of them. I intoned what they expected to hear. Oh, spirits, reach out and use this vessel to relay your will. I relaxed my eyes and reached out through the Vermvisio. I saw the threads of reality that were woven around the women present. From Ruth, I saw a thread that I had learned through years of study and observation indicated that she had indeed made a deal with Satan to get something. Probably her fame and status. I wasn't about to sever that. I didn't have the authority or the permission. Besides, if she doesn't declare Christ as Lord, then severing that thread means less than nothing in the long term. Around Gwyneth, I saw all manner of horrors connected to her, but... She just placidly accepted it, like she didn't even notice what was going on. The Indian woman asked me, Please try to contact my mother, Lakshmi, in heaven. It has been a year since she had died, so she must have finished her journey across the river and is in Yama's realm. I want to know if she knows when she'll be reincarnated. Gwyneth said, Oh, that is lovely. I had no idea you were such a devout Buddhist. Cat hissed for silence again. To keep the illusion up while I was searching for the threat between Ginny and Kat, I absentmindedly made, well, one of the biggest mistakes of my life. You see, I take a risk doing these sorts of things. Even though I wasn't there to contact the dead or spirits or demons, because the other women present were here for that reason, other things have permission to listen in. And so when I said, Lakshmi, your daughter asks for a sign of your presence. Please make yourself known. It was no surprise when I saw a new thread attach itself to the weave that made up the Hindu woman. A dark and evil thread attached to a being that I did not know. A loud thumping sound started. Everyone's eyes flew open and looked around. There was no source. No one was stomping. Cat, who was previously anxious to get this whole thing done, gave me an expression of horrified disbelief. What have you done, you fool? Cat barked out at me. But at that moment... 
Amrataya cut her off and cried out in delight. I feel her. I feel my mother. You did it. Well, I did something. She was going to need to get that taken care of by a priest, but I didn't have time for that. She had opened the spiritual door to evil. I had just welcomed something in. That won't be doing good things to my conscience later. Because I didn't want to risk adding further damage to the women here, I said, Great! We should stop the seance now then, since we've made contact. Wouldn't be a good idea to risk angering the spirits. Ruth started getting upset and insisted that we bring up her Mima. I think she's in hell, because that bitch hated everybody. I want her to know. And at this point, she started yelling out, Hey, Mima! Guess what? You said I'd never amount to anything, but I just went platinum. So you can just watch me from down there and seethe. <laughs> yeah, she shouldn't be talking to the spiritual realm when she's drunk during a seance. I watched as yet another dark and evil thread bound itself to her, too. And another thump was starting. The previous one had not stopped. We had two rival thumpings that were going on simultaneously, keeping perfect rhythm, but not on the same beat. Cat made a cutting motion with her hand and said, Hurry up and finish this! For the first time since it started, I looked at Jenny. She was passed out, whether from drinks or drugs, I couldn't tell. But she was face down on the table, <laughs> drooling a little. It was easy to see the mauve thread that bound her and Cat. Reached out with an expression of will and nudged the drunk Jenny spiritually. Drunk, drugged, she was susceptible to suggestion. So I said to her, You should let Cat go free. She murmured in her sleep, Someone put the cat out. It's meowing. Fake contracts are finicky things. They are a strictly honest people, but to the letter of the law, not the spirit. Therefore, even drunk, even confused, even under magical suggestion, her uttered words were enough to sever the contract that bound Cat to her. As I watched that thread fade from existence, I watched Cat's eyes light up. Immediately, the conservative pencil skirt and business top that she was sporting vanished, and she stood before us, all but naked, with a few thin strands of ivy giving her a shred of modesty in her swimsuit areas. She started to glow and said to the assembled women, Enjoy suffering the fate you have chosen for yourselves. As for you, my dear companion, I think there are dungeons in Tir Nanog that are open and ready for you. With that, she grabbed Jenny, slung the delirious drunk over her shoulders, and turned to me. Our debt is settled. I shall tell my father. Farewell, mages. Do not delve too greedily into the mines of magic. With that, the laying on she, Caitlin, and the hip-hop artist known as Jenny Abernathy, disappeared from the mortal plane. I had to answer some questions with the police. The official story is that a disgruntled manager took the opportunity to kidnap her boss and hold her for ransom. Thus far, since the women verified my story, even drunk and drugged as they were, I've been cleared of involvement, but Ruth and Amrataya, I told them to get in contact with a priest if they found themselves experiencing lingering side effects from the seance. They certainly will. The demons that latched onto them definitely looked hungry. Gwyneth Paltrow, on the other hand, she scares me worse than anything else I saw that night. I think we need to watch her, Control. She may not just be a consort with the Otra Terre, but an agent. I haven't heard yet from Oberon, but it's already Sunday, the day after the deadline, so... I have to assume he is content with my actions. And I have to assume that whatever... Caitlin is doing is... destroying Jenny to his satisfaction. Until next time, this is Jim Donovan. Over and out. Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio. A license under an attribution non-commercial share-alike international license. This episode was written by Ken Dickerson and performed by the same. Ben Wheeler edits, directs, produces, and herds cats. Kid Dickerson performs our audio editing. Visit us on Facebook, read articles on superversivesf.com, or listen to us on unauthorized, Acast, iTunes, or Spotify.
Contact us through Twitter at at Pinkerton's Ghost. Email us at Pinkerton's Ghosts at gmail.com. Or send us noble messenger possums with messages strapped to their backs. Don't worry. They know how to find us. Thank you for listening. And good luck.